Um, hi, everyone. Um, as we all know, the Australian games industry is suffering from a severe talent shortage. In our last game development survey, hiring employees with specialized skills was cited as the number one challenge for the very first time. This is the reason why the guiding theme of this year's events is developing talent. If you can't access talent, what are some of the ways to internally train it? And what can we learn from other industries? So I'm going to discuss this today with Kate Adams from Mighty Kingdom, Fiona Heron from the Commonwealth Bank, Jess Gillen from Industrial Light and Magic, Elvin Hunt from the Rookies, and Kirsty Parkin, currently working for the South Australian government, but here today is someone who's worked for a long time in the VFX industry. Let's start with a round of intros. Um, Kirsty, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, my name is Kirsty Parkin. Um, I currently work within uh, the small business team within what is now the Department for Industry Innovation and Science in South Australia. Um, obviously, creative businesses, including games and VFX, uh, are, are often small businesses. Um, and we have um, in the past and still are sort of taking a sector wide approach to how we can can help the sector in South Australia. Uh, previously, um, I've worked for uh, Rising Sun Pictures in South Australia, working to sort of help them develop their training. Before before that, I worked for um, an online website called, which, which if, if you've been around for a long time, you might remember, called CG Society. And uh, my role there was sort of developing their international online training. And that's how I know Alwyn Hunt initially. So, um, yeah. And before that, I worked in there sort of with creatives in the advertising sector. So I've spent a lot, lot of time working with, with sort of creative people in, in various ways. Fantastic. Thank you, Kirsty. You mentioned Elvin. Well, Elvin, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jens. Um, Alwyn Hunt. So I'm one of the co-founders of The Rookies, which is a, a platform for really helping young people get into creative industries um, through a various various means and ways. Um, we support them uh, not only on their journey, but at, but at the start and sort of at the finish with sort of certification and stuff like that. I'm also um, working for Adobe as business development for the 3D&I division. Um, where I'm manager of the ANZ territory here. So yeah, a lot on my plate at the moment, but yeah, lots going on. Hi, I'm Jess Gillen. I'm the Emerging Talent Specialist at the Industrial Light and Magic Sydney Studio. So um, we opened up in Sydney in 2019. And as a part of that, we've sort of really been embedded in the experience of onboarding talent, sort of really understanding the um, challenges of talent, but also the opportunities for talent. Um, my role is really about investing in building diverse pipelines of VFX talent in the industry so that we can both sort of have a capacity within ILM, but also, you know, as a sort of citizen of the VFX industry in Australia, we're really also invested in um, building capacity in the industry because as the industry is more robust, we're more robust. And my background, I should say, is um, in film education. So I've um, my previous role was working at the Australian Film Television and Radio School around um, in, in their master's program around curriculum development. And so I'm, you know, my career has really been focused on talent and you know developing skill. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Kate. Over to you. Hi, I'm Kate. Um, I work as an L&D manager at Mighty Kingdom uh, Games, um, and I'm responsible for the upskilling internally as well as all of our outreach, um, sort of building in the framework for, for the likes of work experience, um, marginalised groups as well as schools as well, um, and, and really focusing on, on the upskilling, the trajectories of our internal staff. Um, from when I started um, two years ago, we've really grown um, from quite a small team and now we're, we're sort of around 169 at the moment. So um, I'm very busy, <laughs> as all of you are as well. Um, I should also mention that while my background is not gaming, I come from film predominantly um, and you know, from an artist level, growing up into, into this role has been really exciting for me. Great. Thank you very much for um, being part of this, Kate. And last but certainly not least, we have Fiona. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Fee Heron. A little bit of the odd ones out from the, the games industry from a professional level, but not on a personal level. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be part of this. So my role um, at ComBank is to manage some graduate programs here. So really building those talent pipelines. There's a lot of similar similar people on the panel today. Uh, my background is all around talent and, and people um, a bit sort of broad generally, and then really specialising into the early career space in the last couple of years, um, trying to find, you know, what is that skill set that we want to build rather than buy down the track? Um, and what are we doing, particularly around um, the specialist areas for me is engineering, cyber and, and data science. So really in that technical space, um, everyone in my family is an engineer or a teacher. So I found myself right in the middle of the two um, in, in loving sort of the tech space. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Fee. All right, well, look, let's get into it. Kate, we've talked about the um, Mighty Kingdom graduate program two years ago at the very first iteration of this event. Um, what has changed since then? And what are some of the insights that you've, you've gathered since then? Oh, my goodness. We, we have poured in so much effort um, and resources into our grad program. Um, it's sort of difficult to, to have a starting point, to be honest. Um, but one of the things that we've really developed and continue to develop um, are our matrices for our graduates, as well as our competencies. Um, our onboarding process is, is an infinite beast, um, but we're certainly building some cohesion there and, and really coming up with, with a structure um, for our project integration, as well as our, you know, our basic timelines um, for our grads, um, you know, to, for the first three weeks, what does the onboarding process look like? Um, really leaning in there and, and helping them with their soft skill development um, from a cultural perspective within MK as well, so that they can integrate seamlessly, um, as well as sort of building up those, those knowledge sets um, for our grads as well. So really assessing where they currently sit, where they would like to be, um, and sort of putting in those, those resources for them. So putting in, in the time and effort, I guess you could say, to, to really see them, see them grow and, and build out those, those training initiatives as well. Just within that safe bubble, I call it the safe bubble, the first three weeks. Um, they're usually chomping at the bit to really get in there and get into project work. Um, and so we've really got to rein them in a bit and to say, okay, you're here, you made it. Um, just take a breath, take a minute. We're really glad, glad that you're, you're motivated. Now let's, you know, let's, let's build in slowly. And so building in that, that integration of project work usually starts from around week three, week four, depending on, on the graduate, how, how competent they feel and, and proficient they are. Um, but also what we've also developed as well is our mentor preparation. Um, what we've found is, you know, obviously, or at least obvious to me, um, you can't just have anybody mentor. It takes a specific skill set. Um, and so building on those soft skills, you know, what does feedback look like? What happens when someone doesn't like the feedback that they're given? Um, and also reporting, levels of reporting as well is also really important. Um, you know, travel upwards to our directors as well as out. So the mentors can, can lean on the likes of myself for the technical skill set um, and also our talent team for, for the soft skills so that they can, they can lean on them and, and provide those insights and support, I should say. Um, what else, what have we learned? Oh my goodness, so many things. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've learned is that while we have a framework set up, we're never quite fully prepared for what the graduate meets us with. So what skills do they bring and how do we work with them instead of hinder them? So it still needs to be nebulous and have organic flow. Um, at MK, everybody has a voice and it's something that we've fostered. Um, so if, if a, a graduate feels ready, for example, or if, if they really feel like, oh, maybe I'm gonna step into this role, um, then we, we have that discussion. It's, it's not an ironclad um, solution just to put them into a specific role because that's what they applied for, for example. So, so really working with them, uh, the mentor and grad relationship is, is really close. It's a tight knit one. Um, and, oh my gosh, yeah, there's just so much. <laughs> there's so much here. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, there really are a lot of elements to your graduate program. And, you know, as you pointed out, you are pouring a lot of resources into it. I mean, I guess um, looking at the challenges that the industry is facing, um, has this helped you address the talent shortage? Yeah, to be honest, we, we haven't suffered a talent shortage. And, and while I'm reticent in saying that, I think that while having the, the graduate program is fantastic, it's not necessarily about just gaining talent. Um, for MK, it's much more about building those community networks and, and the uplift um, for our next generation of, of gamers, essentially. Um, our artists, we want to invest in them. We want to invest in our next generation. So also very much highlighting the cultural aspect. Yes, absolutely, yeah. So our application process and our review process for for the graduate program is is very intense. It's very in depth, mm. um, and for you know for the first dare I say three weeks, possibly more, four weeks, um, we have no idea who who the applicant is. So it's it's very unbiased. Our portal is um, has just come come through this full circle um, rebirth, I guess you could say, um, of of really revealing certain statistics and you know measurements on um, who who they might be, where they come from, but no name, for example. And, yeah. and you know that's really important for us because then we as a company can can assess with an unbiased view. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, I think that's also reflected in the gender balance within Mighty Kingdom, for example. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Mighty Kingdom graduate program has been partly inspired by programs in other sectors, such as accountancies and consultancies. As you've heard before, FEE here represents the Commonwealth Bank. And um, FEE, can you talk about the program you're looking after, but also, and very importantly, tell us if there are any elements in there that the games industry might want to, worth, might want to uh, think about adapting? Yes, absolutely. I'm just going to call myself out for two things. I am looking down at the screen of some notes from where my brain was working another day. Um, and I do, I don't think this panel knows, and I'm happy to disclose this to the to the group and the wider audience. I have a disability. I have low vision. So I will at times be not quite looking in the right direction and things. So please bear with me while I uh, sort of fumble my way through my points and, and trying to read my, my notes. Um, with ComBank, I mean, we can't really walk past the privilege that we have of being such a known brand and such a large scale. Um, with that scale, traditionally we had maybe 100 to sort of low 100 um, grads. We've got about 250 this year and we're looking at closer to 400 next year, really rapid growth and scale in that. Um, there's a core, we sort of, being so big, it's it's a really intricate mix of what's the core development skills that we think everyone needs to have and then what is each business unit on all the different arms and all of the different career paths at Combank, how are they feeding and consuming in that right part? And that's been a really big thing that I've certainly been looking at in the last two years of what's what's the, there's so many different ways you can cut it um, and really thinking what's actually the skills that we need. So thinking about technology, um, it really wasn't servicing us to have a really open to anyone program. And it is I should clarify that is open really to anyone, but in terms of we want engineers, we want technical cybersecurity specialists. So having an open door was, is not the best experience for the grad. So we really looked that through of what are we doing that's right by the talent to say, we can build, we can teach you how to be a great engineer here. You need to come with this passion. What can't we teach you? is that drive your own passion rather than people who might have come from something completely, you know, we're not set up to build you completely from scratch. You need to have, you know, done a little bit of studying. And I, I like the idea that one day we can get there and really completely teach everyone. But this is where I start to speak of the scale because there's heaps of other people. There's a really wonderful talent community inside ComBank who look at this from every different sort of angle um you know with that number of over 200 years this year 100 of those are engineers so that scale is massively massively growing and, and thinking on that and honing into the clarity of what we need in the business but also what we as a business feel is a skill set to invest in for the community as a whole in tech in the, in the world you know we know that there's not enough people in this skill set so what are we doing 
And we really take that seriously of how are we improving the tech industry by what we're investing in, the skills that we're focusing on, encouraging people to study the right things in the first place. You know, there's such a critical gap of how many people we all want at that, at that end of just coming into schools and thinking, encouraging people to study the right things. So that's something that we do a lot of work with. And as I said, I'm, I benefit from a massively known brand and a, and a scale of a business. So there's lots of people that, that focus in on that. Um, there was a couple of things that I was thinking about in terms of um, what elements to sort of adapt. And coming back to sort of the, those objectives is really knowing who you are as a business and what you want, that we're not out there trying to be a fun, creative back, uh, like sandbox for people to play in. We do have a lot of fun at work, but you know, we we know that there is a seriousness that we do. We impact so many Australians. There is a huge critical piece of what we do. If something goes wrong for us, that stops people being able to pay the rent or buy their coffee. So we we can't match, you know, the the really fun environment. So we we don't try to. We go right. This is what we are. We hire grown ups for exciting jobs, massive impact that's really unique to our business, and we we lean into that and think about how we. We are engineering the future of banking, literally, and that's become our brand of how are we doing that and not trying to be anything else. Um, I really liked, uh, I was reading through the, the Mighty Sort of Kingdom overview, and I think that's such a wonderful part of, you know, really good basics. And I really liked what you were saying before, Kate, about starting in the right way. That's so important to think about. Like there'll be eager talent, but you've got to get those foundations right for what it means in your business or your industry. And then get out of their way and let them run at velocity and, and speed and, and what they need to. Um, the other industry body um, that I would recommend would be the Graduate um, Association, so AAGE. There's so much resource and, and um, networking and community there to help up. There's so many different bodies, large and small. So we all really try to learn from each other as a grad community. I think that's a really great way to, like I was quite new to that in the last two years and have really lent into learning from each other there's really only so many ways that you can kind of slice these things we're all effectively doing the same stuff but making sure you know that tone for yourself and your business and think about okay where are we where are we focusing on what are the skills that we want um there's probably two other call outs that I will make if I can use a little bit more time um, is thinking about the inclusion and the belonging of your people. Um, personally, that's what drew me to ComBank and that's what, you know, will identify people to brands. I don't think that's new news to anybody, but it's not, it's a necessity. It's not a nice to have anymore for, you know, anyone in that HR space. And similarly, your talent programs are not kind of one, one HR problem or, or a program person. It has to be the whole business and really part of that so the mentorship having the right people doing that ha making sure people feel that they can be themselves at work and having that sense of belonging is critical there's so much choice for people and that is the real differentiator of being clear on who you are so people can identify with that and then really protecting that for them I think that's a big part of what people should expect from a graduate program is that pathway and that that protection to be like no don't come and learn all of our bad habits as people who've been in the industry for a long time recreate our business for the future and reshape that this is the skills we think you need to have but then you know you tell us what we, you think we need to do better and I think for this audience in particular thinking about the partnerships and the advocates that you would already have so so for example um you know we sponsor some degrees so we get out into the universities of those areas um we sponsor the pinnacle foundation so supporting lgbtq youth thinking about where the, where are the audiences that you really want to invest in and that you make sense for you as a brand or you as individuals, what you're passionate about, engaging those students before they're ready to apply and thinking about, um, yeah, you know, I think there's such a, a unique opportunity for people to sponsor things like eSports and then be like, oh, hi, if you're playing games and then also studying on the side and what are you thinking about your career and things like that. So there's probably stacks of advocates that you already have who might be thinking about careers elsewhere but how can you bring them back into why not work in the field that you're loving and and have been a fan of for you know since probably early teens if not younger um, I think there's a really unique part to lean into the places you're already advocating already have a bunch of sponsors 
um, sponsorship, sorry, and, and things like that. So that's, I'll probably end there because I'm probably stealing somebody else's ideas. Um, but that was sort of the couple of things I was thinking about to, to lean into those opportunities. Reach is also something that uh, figures in other talks that you know we've done um, for for this event and the importance of getting yourself out there and actively collaborating with educators. Um, so you know I think a great example here of how some practices in other industries easily translates into the games industry and how it be worthwhile to you know have a look what other industries are doing. Another example being the animation and the FX sector. Um, you know another industry heavily impacted by skill shortages. So. Um, Jess, what measures has ILM taken to um, to address these? And, and what are some of the key takeaways? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jen. So I think um, when we when we first opened the studio in 2019, the strategy was to initially bring over some ILM experienced staff and then to hire locally. And I think to Kate and Fee's point, that idea of being able to have a foundation of people who really understand the work to then be able to bring, you know, mentor and support um, new talent has been a really sort of strategic focus for us. I think the ILM pipeline is really complex and, you know, has 45 years of um, sort of legacy and it's challenging sort of to bring people in and just to be able to uh, adapt to that pipeline. There has to be a really significant focus on internal training. And um, we have a really, really incredibly sort of real, well resourced um, global training department that focuses on, on doing that, but also focuses on succession. So focuses on being able to bring people in and then being able to, you know, them to have long careers at ILM that progress. Um, and we're really invested that training is, is about onboarding into the pipeline, but it's also uh, the VFX pipeline, just making the distinction between talent pipeline and VFX pipeline. Um, and then, you know, being able to actually then also invest in their development. So I wanted to make that point first, but in terms of the, um, the, the, there is a, you know, a global talent challenge and it has really impacted our industry and, um, you know, at a time as well where we come in and we have, um, then we experience COVID, which has been a huge challenge with us in our onboarding and our growth. Um, but we are growing really quite fast and rapidly and, you know, because we're responding to this amazing increase in VFX content. Um, and some of the ways that we're responding to that gap is really investing in, uh, as I said, building this pipeline of emerging talent and really having a very long term view of doing that. So understanding that it's capacity building, which is a, a you know, a, there's a long term return on investment. So we're working really closely with education at the moment, consulting and really um, understanding what we need in our, in our, in our growth and in our um, understanding, you know, what building capacity means for us. Um, and then working with education to ensure that, that there is an understanding of our needs. And, you know, and more broadly, you know, industry needs and making sure that there is, a, you know, a really deep connection between our education partners through outreach and us and also our government partners and industry and community partners. So outreach is a really significant element and strategic partnerships is a significant element for us. Um, we think about, you know, it, we, we, we have a strategy around you know, inspiring young people as well at school age, um, you know, it's, and, and it is about inspiring. So we think about, you know, that, you know, visual effects is, you know, quite a, you know, especially how ILM approach it, where we are investing people having long, stable careers in our studio. It's actually a really um, sort of exciting and stable 
career option for young people. So we're also really focused on branding that. And I think the other thing for um, this relevant here as well is something that we have to be open to because of the talent challenges are transferable skills. So, you know, we think about what are the skills from technology and gaming and, and other things that where people who have an interest in working on the content that we're, that we're um, delivering, that there is an opportunity for us to work with our, with our internal training programs to work with those um, in those sort of transferable skill areas. I think it's really important that our industry is open to that. Um, and I just want to highlight one of our programs, our Jedi Academy program, which some may have heard of. It's um, our, it's a 12, it's a global sort of talent development program. So it's an eight to 12 week intensive training program um, where we bring in, it's discipline specific. So we bring in sort of depending on the need for our juniors that, um, you know, how many we need, we bring in sort of small cohorts. We've had one in Roto and Paint, one in Layout and one in Animation so far, you know, sort of short time. We've had, you know, 25 Jedi who've graduated from the program. Um, we've been able to, we've been really focused on gender equity and we've been able to achieve 50-50 some, and, and more, but at least 50-50 gender split in those academies. And we also have a really significant focus on diversity and inclusion. And, and I think echoing through what you said, it's not just a nice to have, it is a business priority. Um, and that's global as well. And we have, you know, it's actually really extraordinary being a part of, sort of a global VFX organization because we have, you know, incredible support for that mission as well, globally. Um, but as well as, so the other element of the Jedi Academy that's really important for us is that it's where we offer our um, Jedi a 12 month contract. So it's not like they just come in for eight weeks and they're competing for a place because we don't want it to be a competitive learning environment. We have a culture at ILM of collaboration and um, it's really, really important that we infuse that into our graduate program. So it's they're, they're in, for that period of training, they're in a learning environment. They're not in a professional zone. So um, they're learning about our proprietary tools. They're learning about our culture. They're immersed in the production environment, but it is within a learning zone. So they're not on shops. They're not, they don't have those sort of pressures until they graduate from the um, uh, sort of eight to 12 week program, depending on the discipline needs. They graduate from that and then they move in from a graduate to a junior role and they do start working in shops. So it's really amazing because it's also based around our show needs. They're going to be working on shows, but really important to us that we focus on a non-competitive collaborative learning environment for that first period. Um, it's been really sort of amazing in ways that we never expected. The people who have, they've, you know, almost everyone who has come through the, the Jedi Academy are still with us and are really thriving. Um, they've been able to sort of innovate in ways that are really amazing. I mean, especially through COVID when we had to move these academies to online and just, I, I, I sort of love this detail, but they would, um, in order to still have a sense of cohesion they created this sort of very simple innovation of they would just have we work in the google suite and they would just have this google room open all day and they would just work they while they're working so that they could just still have that sense of collaboration and they could turn to each other and talk to each other and guide each other and have sort of have that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and that innovation has actually now really you know immersed in our whole studio environment so as we've moved to like a hybrid working um environment we our teams do that you know and it's been really organic but it's an innovation that happened at that jedi academy level and for me that's why i really love emerging talent because there is so much ability to to innovate and they really are sort of investing in them as as, as future leaders in our industry um, much more to say, but I think I'll leave it there um, for the moment. But just yeah, highlighting that program, and also I should say we've we've um, we've just completed um, a, an internship program with Create New South Wales and Accessibility Arts, um, which went incredibly well. Um, 
and also we have a technology internship coming up at the end of the year as well where we're really focused on it's going to be female centered technology internships so we're focused on um, developing more female representation in pipe te um, technical directing desktop ta engineering um, so we're really uh, we're really happy to be able to sort of roll that out um, toward the end of this year as well was the massive brand behind you that outreach and inspiration probably is also a bit, bit easy. I mean, the very fact that you call them Jedi almost makes me want to, you know, consider a career change because that is such a cool title. You know, if I tell my wife. I know, right. And actually, <laughs> like, just yet to Fee's point, like, we, we are very sort of lucky with our branding legacy as well. Like, it, it, it is very helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, it, it you know, it, it does feel inspirational. I mean, you, you mentioned the global training department. Is there also scope for that department to train um, juniors to to um, mid level and then potentially senior skills? Like, is there sort of a scaffolding happening that that you've planned out? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it's it is focused on um, needs based. So it is um, available to everyone in the studio. So, um, and it's really responsive and flexible to whatever we need. So if somebody sort of says, okay, we're working on a show and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a skills gap or a knowledge gap here, you know, let's pull something together so that we can be responsive to that and, and lift people up to, to where, so that they um, feel that like they have the knowledge to thrive. I mean, we have this amazing thing here of, you know, that, that um, if you're trying to figure out something for more than 15 minutes, you know, um, and you haven't found a solution, ask. You ask, ask somebody and so our training sort of takes that philosophy as well so it's really about it's responsive to need but also it is it is um available to training juniors um mids and seniors and supervisors and everybody actually goes through no matter what level you're starting it goes through an intensive sort of four-week onboarding process um so you could even if you have for example we have a lot of people who have come who've returned to ILM um after being at the studio so even people who have worked at ILM here before and, and come back are, are sort of immersed in that in that training and onboarding for them when they you know see where they can go from where they're at and you know what the end goal is yeah absolutely it's really focused on on um succession and, and career growth as well yeah from padawan to obi-wan um kirsty you've worked in the vfx industry for a long time as well and you know as we've heard you worked in some high profile studios too can you give us some examples of programs that you've um worked in um you know that where the aim was to to um, eternally train um talent and uh, you know are your experiences commensurate with uh with jills but sorry jess beg your pardon <laughs> Thanks, Jens. Yeah, Jens. Uh, yes, I mean, I think what I'm. It was really interesting to hear about um, the talent program at ILM and the maturity of that program, and and I guess um, the results of that maturity um, for ILM. And I guess my experience in the earlier days of, I guess, training and talent development. It, it's really interesting to see the progression and see how that's moved forward um, because I think you know possibly 10 years ago there wasn't the sort of talent shortage there is now there was almost much more of a lack of awareness within the industry there wasn't the formal education that there is now I think um, in Australia particularly um, our tertiary institutions have um, developed, they're developing programs and developing training and, and developing students, um, I guess, in accordance with demand, but sort of 10 years ago, that wasn't there. So when I first started working at Rising Sun, um, the founders of, of Rising Sun had identified really that they needed to train their own talent, but didn't really have the capacity to do that while also delivering their shows and had made some sort of steps towards partnerships with tertiary institutions um, and so when I when I first came on board there we worked really closely to I guess um, fine-tune that relationship or those relationships we moved from one tertiary institution to another and sort of really built and and and, and fine-tuned that to to I guess deliver um, 
what what Rising Sun needed at the time, and that that program's still going, and it's 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 expanded um, since and, and become much broader. But the premise behind it um, was really about ensuring that um, the best artists within the organisation had the opportunity to share their skills and knowledge with the young people, the students, because that they were at the time and probably still are at, at the cutting edge of what they were doing globally. And the universities and training institutions at the time with, with the best will in the world could not really compete with that. Um, they could not compete with the sort of somebody who has just reprogrammed Houdini to create an explosion that nobody else has been able to do. If that person is teaching you, you've got the best teacher in the world. And it doesn't really matter what degree you have, what qualifications you have. If this guy can teach you this, then you have the best possible teacher. And so that that was sort of the premise behind it, um, making sure that that at the time um, the facility was training the best possible people for themselves but at the time we were overtraining. so and i think rising sun still do overtrain. like i think you know they still do send amazing trained people out out into the community at large um so it was it was sort of developing that and ensuring that the people who were training internally um had had the time and space to commit to to teaching the students which was a, a quite, at times quite a difficult balance. Um, if, if you're trying to deliver a show and then sort of teach students at the same time, that could be hard. So that was a really hard thing in the early days to make sure um, that we worked we, we worked through. Um, but that partnership um, has become quite successful. And I think the University of South Australia sort of has taken that, that initial partnership and sort of built that down now within the organisation. Uh, there's another um, institution in South Australia, Flinders University, they, they, they're starting to build partnerships with facilities as well. Um, so you have that, that sort of crossover and ability for students to then end up having everything they need. They've got the degree that they might need to, to make travel easier and that their parents want, but they also have that sort of, those sort of cutting edge um, creative and technological skills, which allow them to be successful um, in the broader industry um, as, as a whole. But it's, it's really interesting to hear um, what ILM and MK are doing now, which is rather than just focusing on, on the teaching and making sure that the skills are right, is really focusing on that sort of whole person development. That's that's what is what what has progressed. I think that that sense of truly nurturing young people when they come on board and seeing them, you know, as as a holistic, long term resource that you need to sort of nourish. Um, and I think that's the progression that that we have seen, and we, which which I really hope um, we continue to see. Um, so back in the in the bad old days of of cowboy training, um, I worked for an online um, website. I think this is like two thousand and nine or something like that. And they just basically said, "Oh, can can you do some training? Just build some training." I was like, "Oh, okay, all right, I'll do that." But at the time, it was an online site, so the idea was that if anybody worked in a facility anywhere in the world and wanted to run some training about anything they wanted. Then the answer was basically yes you could do that um so we got some fantastic training and we got some really terrible training as well um it was quite egalitarian because anybody in the world could access it if they had an internet connection um and it was it was um yeah it was it was it was cowboy days it was at the forefront of of anything that was sort of formal. So, you know, we, we had a, an instructor who died halfway through the, the class and we had to figure out how to do that online. We had a class that was supposed to last for 10 weeks and it lasted for two and a half years um, because the, the instructor just kept, kept getting too busy and not being able to get back to the class. But she was a wonderful, wonderful instructor. So her students stuck with her and they still stayed at like they still stay in contact today they've gone to each other's weddings and funerals so that there was amazing um community that was was built out of um you know i guess the cowboy days of, of online education um and having being at the beginning of something 
gives you a huge freedom to experiment and work out what works and work out who works and what what kinds of formats work. Um, and that, looking back, you don't realise it at the time, but that looking back was actually quite freeing and exciting, but it obviously couldn't continue. You, you, you do need to have that sort of, to take that beginning bit and move it into something that is more structured and, and formal with, with more predictable outcomes um, and that allow the students who are participating um, a pipeline into something that's that's actually, you know, a good career for them and that's, that's going to sort of work for them. Um, so, yeah, seeing that progression, you know, of the industry as a whole from something that is seen as sort of on the fringes and that if you want to learn it, you've got to log online and see if you can find a course in, in, in you know, modelling for Maya, you know, and spend two weeks, you know, making a dog into something that is mainstream and taken seriously and um, you know, has a, a long-term career. It, it's just been a wonderful journey and you know it's really amazing listening to, to Jess and, um, and Kate talk now about how companies care and take that long-term approach to ensuring that they develop um, a talent pool, not only for themselves, but that will then, you know, sort of, I guess, develop the entire industry, not, not only in South, in Australia and, and South Australia, obviously, but, but globally. Um, and part of the work I do now within the South Australian government, I guess, is taking that, that it's a particularly South Australian overview because, you know, that, that, that's my job, but we sort of look at the industry as a whole and actually look at what everybody's doing. So what all the all the, all the facilities are doing, games facilities, VFX facilities in South Australia. Um, look at the training institutions and just have a look at the balance of the, of the industry as a whole. Um, so we can have a look at where it's going, how we can help, how we can support, you know, where the holes are in the training. Um, so, yeah, I think because of the journey that the industry's been on and because of the massive growth that we're getting in games and and actually in demand for content i think there's just so much more to go and to, to pull all of that sort of structure uh, together now um is just going to stand us in better stead for the future if we can continue as you're saying just to sort of partner with our training institutions partner with governments and make sure that um the industry is seen as a serious industry because it is. I think a lot, a lot of the times people think that because it's fun and we're playing games and watching films, that this isn't, this isn't a serious industry. It's very, very serious. It's as serious as banking. It's really awful if you can't buy coffee. It's also really awful if you can't play a game on your phone or you can't watch a movie. I know that sounds bad, but if you ask some people you know, would you prefer to not be able to play a game? It, it, it's a huge part of the fabric of our life and it, it matters. So entertainment actually is important. If we didn't have it, we, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's as important as coffee and I love coffee. So I, I, I think that's one of the big challenges we have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's certainly something that became evident during the pandemic, didn't it? You know, without entertainment, yeah. I think we were all gone sure somewhat insane. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's yeah. exactly that's exactly right. No, it's true, and it it's it is how we connect, and it's also the things that bind us. So if you have a look at, it might have got teenage children, for example, and they're all rushing off going to see the the latest Marvel film, you know, and they understand the full timeline. They they know all the characters. They've got you know they've got all the lore down. You know, all of that sort of stuff, and that's a huge part of how they connect socially so to not have that i think is very serious and we need to take our industry very seriously um one of the things that i used to find when i was in a role very similar to kate's when you know used to go and do outreach and you know talk to the parents of students in high schools and obviously i've, I've got teenage kids myself now and you know some of my friends have teenage kids and having to talk to them about you no know, it's okay if your son and daughter wants to go and a plays games because it's fun it's okay 
um, but also if they want to go and work in games because that is serious and there is a huge career out there for them and no please don't you know send try and funnel them off into something else so I think that's changing as well I mean Jess and Kate you would experience that as well and so so you would probably be almost better place than me now to be able to talk to that but I actually think and Alwyn too because actually Alwyn you deal with lots of um, parents of of, of of you know teenage kids but trying to help people shift that mindset um, and help them understand that this is a huge global industry and probably growing faster than any other industry it, right now. That's exactly helping right. parents, yeah, helping parents yeah. understand that I think is going to be key to ensuring that um, that we have continual supply within our workforce. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think you know, I agree. I think you know, um, getting the pipeline right as, as early as possible really is crucially important also you know um in the context of of gender for example you know highlighting also the girls that this is something that they can do um you know as a father of a five-year-old i don't want a five-year-old girl i don't want her to feel limited in that respect and you know kate you brought up some other very good points as well for example universities sometimes inability to just you know catch up with technological progress which i think that also highlights the importance of getting some fundamentals right, you know, getting sort of a mindset right, that you're open to learning, that, um, you know, you are in a position where you can take on these things once you are, or once you've started your job. Um, and, uh, you know, as part of that also then highlighting the importance of internal champions, as well as the notion of mentorship, again, something that's done and celebrated in Mighty Kingdom and ILM. Um, you mentioned Elvin. Let's give him an opportunity to say something as well, because he had to stay silent for such a long time. Elvin, um, as someone who works at the intersection of industry and education, what are some of the best practice examples that you've come across when it comes to internally um, training, to, to internal training of, of talent? Yeah, I mean, just before I touch on that, you know, like all the stuff that all the panelists have talked about today, you know, I think, you know, where the rookies is positioned is really about you know, getting students and grads ready for these, you know, for the for that next step. You know, we really are that bridge. And I think, you know, and I'm fortunate enough that I sort of sit in a position, you know, note both with Adobe and with the rookies, that, you know, as as I said, sit and I, I'm able to see on a global stage and not only in visual effects or in games, but in a lot of other industries that are now, you know, demanding 3D content creation, right? So when when we talk about games and visual effects and the sort of the struggles that we have going on right now, you know, it's only going to be exasperated by all these other industries that are now wanting, you know, skilled 3D artists, right? So we're already seeing other industries, whether it's fashion and retail or architecture visualization that are actually poaching, you know, artists from within our sector, right? So that's, it's really interesting times. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, with the Rookies has been around for 12 years, you know, I've got a big background in visual effects, you know, where I've worked with several, you know, um, both Kate and, and Kirsty. So, uh, you know, we, we created the Rookies to really bridge that gap, you know, 12 years ago. And, like Kirsty mentioned, education has improved, but when we're talking about the numbers, you know, even Jess, 25 people into Jedi Academy and Kate, you're getting, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's small numbers when you consider on a global stage the amount of, of, of skilled labour that we need in this industry. And we're being, you know, we're, we're having all these other pressures as well. So it's, it's very interesting times. So, you know, the rookies, you know, where we position ourselves is, is really to try and make sure that students are making good decisions early on, right? So we've identified, you know, when you look at the Rookies platform, there's several components to it to kind of help enable students make good decisions. So we have the Rookie Awards, which we attract, you know, thousands of students each year. But from that Rookie Awards, we take the data and then go identify where we think the best schools are being, you know, are coming from and who's doing a great job based on any given year, the quality of the students' work, right? Because that's only a small percentage, but it, like, like the panelists have mentioned, you've got to start from a starting point. And so to be to be able to identify where those good students are coming from is, is super important and also knowing that they're at a good level. Um, the other areas that we focus on really, and it goes to Curse's point, is really looking at high school, you know, we feel like people stumble into these jobs, you know, they, they, they'll go, oh, I really love games, but it's only until later on that they go, oh, there's a school there that do something. And it's it's really, it's 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 about awareness and education to parents, because like to Kirsty's point was that parents 
still uh, uneducated in the career pathways into these creative industries. And, and in some ways, at that level, students are being, you know, educated out of creativity, which is a real shame, you know. So what we're trying to do is focus back on that area and go, actually, you know, here you could be working in 3D and still doing fashion design. Here you could be doing 3D and working. So showing them the career pathways and also the opportunities that, you know, that somebody else mentioned about the skill set that is transferable between multiple industries. So all of a sudden, you've got a great set of skills and these opportunities ahead of you. The problem at high school level is then knowing what at that level they need to have in a portfolio to then apply for a school, you know, a higher education school. So we're putting a lot of energy and we've developed an LMS to really like focus in on that because it's about making sure that they're making good decisions at that. So then, then they tap into our global school rankings. Okay, so where's the best school in Australia to learn games, game design and development? Where's the best school in Australia to learn visual effects? And, you know, the, 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 the problem on a global stage that we see is that there's some countries doing amazing jobs. You look at Europe that, you know, students there, you, you look at that. So it's really the Wild West in terms of like standardization and what <clears throat> when a school, a student that graduates in Australia, for example, is vastly different to somebody that graduates in France or in Germany or wherever it may be. So the credential, you know, that, that sort of, uh, I guess, um, yeah, skill level is very is very wild west. So the the other initiative that we launched at the start of um, this year was the you know the, the certified digital artists, and that's where we work with all our top studios, top industry professionals to gather all this information about okay, what does it mean to be a visual effects artist and to be a modeling artist, and what are the core skills or competencies that you want to see. So that somebody that's coming in, you know, starting to learn games, for example, at least has a blueprint to go, all right, I need to understand these top 10 things. It's a bit of a checklist, right? So it at least puts a stake in the ground on a global stage for students and grads to be able to sort of benchmark themselves against. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it's, it's very fragmented. And I think there's a responsibility not only to to um, to schools and educators, but also to software, you know, software providers. You know, I see it from an Adobe perspective that we need to be upskilling lecturers so they're at a level that they can then pass on that knowledge. There's, a, there's you know, there's there's a responsibility for studios, and and sometimes that's a little bit selfish because it's proprietary software and you have to go down this road, and you know, like there is the certain things that you have to learn to be working at that studio, but still. To, to Kirsty's point, you know, it's it's still expanding on that workforce that can go out into a greater um, to a greater stage. So the things. So what was your question, Jens? Because I just wanted to get that out because it's like you know, it, it, there's so many moving parts in 3D that when you know when we when we focus down on games, there's so many other variables and influences that are happening. But I think it's just I just wanted to make that clear with viewers that hey, you know what? It's a really exciting time because it is a golden age in 3D right now. And yeah. there's you know the metaverse and all the and all the other stuff that's happening as well. So students that are you know that are developing this skill set from an early age, they're going to be the pioneers in a lot of these industries that are now starting to embrace 3D. So um, you know, like it's, you know, the, the opportunities are unbelievable right now. Yeah, absolutely. In particular, also in an age of convergence where all of these creative industries essentially come together, those skill sets become even more transferable. Um, the, the original question was, if you, as someone who works at this intersection of industry and education, have come across some best practice examples of internal yeah. training, is there anything that sticks out? Yeah, I think, you know, if I was to reflect back, you know, we've just we've just closed the Rookie Awards, you know, the, for this year. So, again, we've got a really good uh, bird's eye view of, like, where the top candidates are coming out of and what schools. So, for us to be able to look at that and go, well, what, what sets them apart from that school over here? You know, and, and the ones that do an amazing job are the ones that have really close industry type ties, right? So, they have a lot of um, industry mentors coming in and just – it's it's that it's that cross pollination of industry and education and information that you know keeps everybody up to date. And if you if, if as soon as that gets lost, schools fall behind very very quickly because it's just it's so rapid at our industries that 
if they don't if they don't have that connection they're losing they're losing out very very quickly so I think that's super key for education is just that you know you know to you know what ILM do what you know and and it's it's small because when you look at RSP they just work with one university or you look at CDW it's just one university so it's always you know like it needs to be it needs to be on a bigger on a bigger scale for us to be able to you know keep up and being able to educate enough talent to be able to to come into the workforce so um, yeah, that that's super important. The answer is that sort of really close industry ties because everyone's so busy. Um, and, and I think you know what we're trying to do at the Rockies is trying to support that as well. You know, going oh, you know what this is these are the latest trends. You need you guys over here need to be teaching this as well. So trying to do that, trying to do that on a global stage with our platform and make sure that messaging is, is out there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, something that is, uh, you know, something that figured prominently in other talks um, as part of this event as well. So we're sort of slowly coming to the tail end um, of this panel. I was just wondering if anyone wanted to offer any concluding thoughts or summary or anything that they felt they didn't get an opportunity to bring across. I just, I just like to throw a bit of a question out there because we were talking about, we talk about the talent pipeline and obviously, you know, the sort of, uh, the, the sort of graduate and training um, side of things is is in a in a in a funny way almost the beginning of that sort of talent pipeline, this beginning of a career journey, and as artists um, and TDs get more experienced and their skill level increases and they get more film credits or games credits or whatever, they become more attractive in a global mar marketplace and it is a marketplace and it's a highly highly competitive marketplace, so. I've really enjoyed hearing about how places like ILM and MK have developed graduate programs to, I guess, increase the whole the, the capability of the whole graduate. And Jess was talking about like this is a long term career. What do you guys do around talent retention? So, how do you have programs in place to make sure that once you have trained these amazing, incredible people using these amazing programs, that you know someone just doesn't go, oh, that person looks great. Thank you. I'll just grab them. And obviously, there's nothing you can really, you can't stop it. But is it something that you've taken into account? And and what are some of the things that you've developed around it? That's a really good question. Um, if I can answer to that, I'll do my best. Um, I think in simple terms, it's investment. It's investment in your in your people as an individual and what they bring to the studio, what they bring to their projects, what they bring to their teams. Um, you know, it comes back to that holistic view for an individual um, and pure investment and genuine investment. So sitting down with them and actually building a trajectory of, you know, and starting those conversations around, okay, where do you see yourself in two years? What would you like to learn? Let's build a personal development framework so that we can set aside some time so that you can actually build on those skills, those gaps that you would actually like to invest in. And we're gonna invest in you. And so in simple terms, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, here at MK, we have quite a good retention. Um, and I think people, people begin to feel that as they come in <clears throat> from different, you know, different studios or, you know, different, different streams is that we're actually really genuine in building up the, the holistic you. What is the you? What makes you you? And how do we, how do we bolster that and add buoyancy to that? Yeah, I would love to add. Yeah, no, you go for it. <laughs> Thanks, you next. I think that was Jess that was talking. Um, yeah, I completely agree um, with those points, Kate, and I think it's such a good uh, question. I, you've got to have that investment. I think two things I wanted to add is, um, yeah, looking at what you apply to the grads across the whole workforce. So we rotate our grads through areas so that they have those good foundations. But why does it have to stop at the end of a graduate program? You still have career mobility. You've got those foundations wherever they came from. But how do we get out of the way of people's career velocity and, and aspirations and acknowledging that people are going to move around and making sure that they leave with, you know, a good flavor at the end of the day and they're not leaving so burnt out and and hating it you know they, they continue to be an advocate they continue to 
be you know talking talking that up and being a great part of the community as a whole of whatever industry that they're in um as i super agree this is a very important industry as well i didn't mean to say that it wasn't just because we're <laughs> impacting your your money but um we you know that view that people are going to move around and and okay with that and celebrate that and be part of like great congrats you've got a job somewhere else and thanks for a great career here and all those little uh, micro parts of that experience I think is is one way to really um, think about it as a whole, not just cool. You've done this program, best of luck. You know, it's got to continue on. I think Jesse wanted to jump in as well. I'm just echoing actually both what um, what Fee and Kate have said that I think it's it is absolutely about investing in in the individual and acknowledging that there is a holistic you know, human element to everything that we do and that that really needs to be acknowledged and developed. And I think also um, to fix point that, you know, if you have a, a as, as, as the language that we use as an emerging talent strategy, you have to have a strategy to be able to have them thrive in the studio at all points in their career. So it's, I agree that it's not, um, it's not isolated to sort of one, focus it has to be a focus and I think you know um with ILM there is there is a, a huge focus on, on culture and and our, our commitment to it and that we all you know have a voice that we're all part of you know achieving what you know every day what we're what we're putting out into the world in terms of content and um you know there's a huge infrastructure of support for people to have successful careers here and really thrive here and it's it's incredibly important as as important investment as as you know building that talent pipeline is making sure that the talent are in the studio that they can really thrive and have a really sort of just incredible career um and then just finally because i know i just i just wanted to uh speak to Alan's point I think that the thing that sort of feels like it's coming together today is that you know that we're all part of sort of an ecosystem and that there is you know these incredible like bridging um organizations like the rookies that are able to you know that we're all sort of working in building the ecosystem so that it's robust and so that it's um you know, that we can really sort of, yeah, as, as Kirsty mentioned, have this industry that is incredibly important and, and be able to, you know, really brand it as this amazing career trajectory. And it's really great to have that, you know, there are so many players in the industry as we scale, you know, because you're right, I want to think that, you know, at the point we're sort of maturing our programs and I think that the next scale for everyone is, is the next level is just to think about scale. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how, how that progresses. Panel, because it's about time we wrap this up. I've really, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for your time and insights, Kirsty, Jess, Elvin, Kate, and Fee. Um, really enjoyed this. Thank you.